So for amongst the postdocs, you, you now have the chance to, to answer this question before I even talk. So can it be done? Can we really translate findings from the bench to the bedside rapidly? What, what do you think? Well, I mean, the, absolutely, the answer is yes, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't be giving the talk, right? <laughs> but also, the answer, the, the caveat to that has to be imperfectly. And we're only just beginning to understand how we can do that. We're making mistakes along the way as we do that. We're trying to learn from those mistakes. So as usual, I know uh, my American colleagues always show a picture of where they come from and how amazing you know, the environment is that you work in. Trump that. <laughs> so that's London, OK. But <laughs> and King's College, is, it, where Andrew and I belong to, is right there, except we don't work in that bit. We work in this bit, <laughs> which is in a horrible bit of London uh, called Camberwell. And for those of you who don't know Camberwell, this here is the only tree in the whole of Camberwell. <laughs> and I've just got it in the picture for you, OK? So please don't feel jealous about that picture I've just shown you. So that's where we work. It, the, the purpose of this slide, really, is just to say to you, it's a relatively common disorder affecting approximately 1% of the population. We know that it's four times more common in, in males and females. We know that there's a strong genetic component to it. And we know from recent work that there's likely roles for differences in synaptic function, serotonin, glutamate GABA, and neuropeptides. And in terms of the treatments, we really haven't got treatments for the core symptoms. We do have symptoms, sorry, treatments for the associated symptoms. And I'm not going to be focusing on that today. I'm going to be talking about how we can make progress in terms of the core symptoms. But I don't want you, before I go on to that, to think that that's the most important thing that we can do because we need to make progress much more rapidly than that, and that's going to take time. One of the things that we can do to make progress is to identify and treat people much more rapidly than we currently do. And this is just a slide, a very busy slide, and I apologize for that. And the key take home message is this, is that this is unrecognized ASD and ADHD in a healthcare system. And actually, that's my healthcare system. That's the hospital that I work in, and we are meant to be one of the uh, world leaders within neurodevelopmental disorders, both within children and adults. And you'll see there that within these services that we run, we have an extremely high prevalence of undiagnosed autistic spectrum disorder. In fact, in our forensic settings, up to approximately 17% of our patients would fulfill potentially the criteria for an autistic spectrum disorder, and not one of them has been diagnosed who are in, in this slide. So to make progress, we could just do our job better, right? That's message number one. The next message is this, is once we have diagnosed them, what do we do? This is a review that we carried out as part of EU Aims in terms of trying to understand what the current treatments are for autism around the world. What happens to you if you're in Brazil or Mexico or Canada or wherever? And what you see is whether you're a child, which is the top, or whether you're a, a, an adult, a young adult, which is the bottom, there is a huge variation internationally in the sorts of treatment approaches that you'll be exposed to. Behavioral treatment approaches and educational treatment approaches aren't included on this slide because we couldn't get those from the international databases. But I hope what you will see is just huge variations within those treatments, mainly within the use of antipsychotics and also within the use of antidepressants and ADHD type medications. And I apologize for those of you who've seen this next slide before, but this is the evidence base for that. And that's that. You know, there's really very little decent evidence base underpinning our current treatment strategies, when I'm talking about pharmacology now, for these symptoms which we're, we're, we're currently attempting to treat. So that's for the kind of current treatment approaches. How are we going to make progress? And what are the blocks in us making progress? Well, the blocks in us making progress are a combination of scientific and sort of cultural, sort of political. 
And amongst the scientifics are that we have what's a heterogeneous disorder, and what this slide is obviously is an Andy Warhol. And the take-home message is, you know, they're all soup, right? But inside the tin, they're all different kinds of soup. We're calling them soup, but they've got very different constituents of soup. And so, although on the outside we're labeling them all as the same thing, a Campbell's soup, actually their ingredients are very, very, very different, which is kind of a very simplistic way of trying to get over to you the, not just the clinical, but the biological heterogeneity that is within autism. What's that led to? It's also led to us not really understanding the underpinning pathophysiologies, in other words, the causes of the disorder. So, highly heterogeneous, and we don't understand the pathophysiology terribly well. Then we've also got, of course, the cultural issues that we perhaps don't talk about so much, and that's these. That's the kind of the elephant in the room, for those of you who don't know. In England, that's kind of the way you think, like, well, I wish my mother would really go, that, but we don't mention it, you know, that kind of stuff, or why is my father drinking yet again, you know, that, that sort of thing. So... One of, the way, one of the cultural barriers is the way we think about each other and the way we interact. And I have been at conferences where I've had basic science colleagues literally say in public, you know, we do the real science and the real work and all that other, you know, like intellectually inferior stuff like treatment trials, et cetera, et cetera, is done by the kind of peons, all right? Which is not a terribly good way to make friends with your colleagues and try and translate your findings from the test tube into a patient because if you come to see me or someone like that, you might not get that good a reception if you said that sort of thing. So that's the basic scientist view of clinicians in some places. I know that's not true here because you're all wonderful. And then, of course, on the other hand, we've got your golf playing, Cadillac driving clinician who you know, would be looking down upon our basic scientist. Right? So what we really want to be doing is thinking, how can we work together and put these cultural differences aside, stop picking fights with each other, even within the autism research community, and think, how can we work with each other? Just because you're doing educational approaches or cognitive behavioral approaches, you've got things to teach me and I've got things to work with you on that we can meet halfway in the middle and make more progress. For example, how would my pharmacological approaches enhance or not your behavioral approaches? as opposed to try and say a behavioral approach alone or a pharmacologic approach alone. And then, of course, that's what we all think about each other, right? So we're all fighting already. And then there's what the people actually think about us. And this is what uh, some of your friends and colleagues, film stars, etc., in California, think about people who practice psychiatry, a museum of death. So we've not got a great reputation out there in the community. Frankly, we've not even got a great reputation within my own family. So my own mum, she's got seven kids, okay? I told you guys at lunchtime, seven kids in nine years, okay? Four of us are doctors. And to her great shame, three of us are psychiatrists, okay? <laughs> but here's the key. When we introduce our partners, who happen to be things like liver surgeons, etc., she's saying, oh, you must meet my son-in-law, the liver surgeon, you know? Whereas me, the psychiatrist, is, you know, so it's not just the public, it's also, you know, how we are. So how are we going to make progress? We actually, I think, are at the cusp of being able to make very significant progress because of our increasing understanding of the molecular and biological architecture, which potentially, but no more than potentially, underlies autism. So we now know that although hundreds of genes are implicated, that they actually most likely pin on a, or impinge upon a relatively smaller number of molecular pathways, which in turn impinge upon a relatively smaller number of biologic pathways, which in turn impinge upon a relatively restricted number of regions and circuits to give us the phenotype. We're also now beginning to increasingly understand that the genetic architecture, although many hundreds of genes are implicated, really increasingly appear to be falling into approximately three camps. Those around transcriptional regulation, those around synaptic folding and scaffolding, and those around translation-dependent synaptic signaling. So a gross simplification. But the only take a message from there is from all this complexity, it looks like there may be increasing sort of 
classes and targets for us to begin to focus on. So how do we do that? We have to do that not just scientifically, but also on a policy level by thinking big. And this is what the European Union did. They came up with an initiative called the Innovative Medicines Initiative. And what I'll do in the next part of this talk is just describe to you what the IMI is, and then the brief uh, update on kind of how we're doing in terms of our own IMI findings. And then I'll say to you, well, what's the unpublished stuff and what's the way we're thinking? And I'm just going to give you one exemplar of the work that we're doing, which is all unpublished, okay? Um, each of these studies is imperfect. Each of them will need replication. But I'm just showing you these just to show you the way we're thinking, okay? So what is the IMI? It's a 2 billion euro initiative. 1 billion from the European Union, another 1 billion matching funds from FPIA. And from that came the um, funding that we are given, not a billion dollars, unfortunately, but a reasonable sum of money. And from that, what we do is we put together a consortium when we've won the bid. And that includes both academic partners and industry partners. And those academic partners and industry partners are spread across Europe, as you can see here. And very importantly, also includes Iceland. And for those of you who don't know, everyone in Iceland is genotyped. And so what this gives us is tremendous, uh, really rich information on how genotype impacts upon phenotype within a relatively homogeneous, ethnically non-diverse population. And so what we said was this. In other words, to make real progress, we need to bring all this together, so cellular assays, animal models, translational science, clinical research, and genomics. We absolutely have to have progress in this, informing progress in the animals, and then we need to be translating what we're finding in the animals into humans, and then also back-translating to try and understand what might be some putative mechanisms underpinning some of the findings that we're beginning to get within our autistic population. Does everyone understand kind of what we're doing there? We're trying to really break down the silos, is what's happening. So our overall approach is that we try and adopt models with construct and face validity. In this particular example, uh, we're going to be identifying cellular and functional alterations, for example, at synapses. We then want to be designing and testing pharmacologic interventions, which are based on pathophysiology. And then we're going to be trying to roll those out into patient populations. Now, our remit is not, is absolutely not to run treatment trials. Our remit is to try and identify potential new mechanisms and potential new tools to help develop new compounds and approaches, and then to demonstrate proof of concept that these may be valuable and that these can then be taken on to be used in trials or used by industry. So I'm now going to just tell you about the clinical component of what we're doing. And in our clinical component, we have four studies, one of which is a high-risk uh, high sibling study with 300 high-risk siblings and 100 low-risk controls. We have what we call the uh, LEAP study, which is a longitudinal follow-up study in which we have 400 individuals with autism and 250 controls recruited and followed up for five years. We also have the Icelandic population uh, of CNV carriers, which I'll come on to in a second. And of, of those, we have 300 and 300 controls. And we also are carrying out work in individuals who have a synaptic uh, gene deficit, in this particular uh, film, Dermot syndrome, the Shank 3 um, deficit, to see if we can recapitulate abnormalities in these individuals in the idiopathic population. So how are we doing? We're actually doing pretty well in terms of recruitment. We should have been at 700 uh, individuals in approximately June. Um, we've actually reached 701 or so in August. So slightly delayed, but actually really, if you compare that to a drug trial or something that's actually really pretty good recruitment. How are we doing in terms of QR? Uh, etc. Not bad. We've got very strict um, uh, standard operating procedures. 
we've adopted from the beginning what we call GQ, um, pharmaceutical industry standards for record keeping, et cetera, et cetera. And if people aren't complying, they get a visit. And then if they're still not complying, I visit. And then if they're still not complying, there's a shift in funding. So it's actually really quite rigorous in terms of ensuring that the standard operating procedures are followed and also in terms of QA. In terms of how much information we're being able to gather on our human subjects, we're actually, this is just an example of the electro -phys. We're not doing too badly. We are not getting to 100% in all individuals, but even in our low functioning individuals, for example, here in this EEG, we're getting um, good information in approximately 95% of our population. So not perfect, but actually not too bad at all. So in terms of the approach for today, the example I'm going to give you is I'm going to say, well, an exemplar of what we do is asking these questions. What causes copy number variants to be so common? Then secondly, we now know what's going on. Can we measure how they impact on brain? And if we can, are those measures actually of any use to us? And how can we refine those measures to be better used? And then how can we back translate work from humans into rodents and, and, and vice versa? Then last but not least, can we develop proof of concept in an imperfect way that we can shift the dial in some of the potential pathophysiologies? And then last but not least, can we work together with the European Medicines Agency and the FDA for them to accept our approaches as being valid and for use in trials. So in terms of what causes CNVs to be so common, our, our colleagues in Iceland reported together with us that actually one of the major risk issues um, in terms of mutations associated with autism and schizophrenia is paternal age. So a very non-PC message for you th to the ladies in the audience there. So we've demonstrated that, that's what makes it more common. Then the next question then is, well, can we demonstrate impact of CNVs, of interest for us in autism and schizophrenia, on brain in people who don't express the behavioral phenotype? And the answer is yes, we can. In a separate study um, by Andreas and his colleagues, we demonstrated a sort of a dose-dependent effect between the deletion and the duplication in the volume of brain regions which we know are implicated within an autistic spectrum disorder. But where does that take us? Well, kind of everywhere and nowhere, really, because all that demonstrated is that this, there's an association between brain anatomy and that CNV in terms of volume. But as you can see, things may be the same volume, but they can be completely different, right? So apples and oranges have the same volume, but they're completely different things. The question now is, how can we begin to sort out those apples and oranges, and can we do it in a way that's going to be informative for our studies to help us unpack that pathophysiology? And the examples I'm going to give you now are just around structural imaging. But there's many other ways you can do this, for example, with electrophys, et cetera. But just for today, we're going to be talking about structural imaging. So one of the things that you can do then, and just, instead of just talking about overall brain volume, is you can begin to break down brain volume into its two constituent parts. That's cortical thickness and surface area. And for those of you who are about to nod off, I can't say I blame you, but the, the reason why this is important is this, is that these have different neurodevelopmental underpinnings and different genetic contributions. So for example, at the moment, there's some evidence that neural ligands one and two might modify cortical thickness but not surface area. And there's some evidence that MECP2 may modify or modulate surface area, but not cortical thickness. And there's also some evidence that these geometric features, such as sulcal depth, curvature, and gyrification, may be underpinned by other etiological pathways which are relevant to autism, and particularly gyrification index, which I know Christine Nordahl here has reported on before may have a significant environmental contribution to it. So what? Well, what we've done then is said, can we get proof of concept 
within individuals with autism that they have differences in brain volume, but you can then fractionate samples into those who have differences in cortical thickness and surface area, and what kind of degree of overlap is there. And the answer is, actually, those regional differences in volume are explained in different brain areas by different pathological processes. So in one region, it'll be due to cortical thickness, in another area, surface area, and in relatively few areas, due to overlap. And then what Christine did, Christine Ecker, whose work this was, was she said, can we use that using machine learning techniques to then categorize individuals as being affected versus non-affected or having another neurodevelopmental disorder? And this proof of concept work, Christine demonstrated, you can actually get pretty good accuracy in young adult populations. Probably wouldn't be true in other populations, for example, children, but we're not sure. So that's in terms of gray matter anatomy. The next question then is, well, how can we begin to fractionate connectivity, inverted commas? And so we spent a considerable amount of time thinking about how we should be doing that, not just in terms of the usual suspects in terms of DTMRI, but thinking, well, you know, the neuron is actually encased in this stuff called myelin, so we can't just look at the neuron itself. We need to also examine how that's related to differences in myelination. And we also need to ask is, well, if we get a difference in connectivity, white matter connectivity, what's driving that? Is that secondary or primary to differences in cortex? And if so, where? The other issue that we've been toying with is how on earth do we begin to get proxy measures of cortico-cortico connectivity with structural anatomy? And again, this is work of Christine's, who's been looking at mean separation distances as a proxy measure of cortico-cortico connectivity and finding significant differences between cases and controls which relate to symptomatology. Then again, work of Christine's, which is unpublished, I should say just going out, in which she's saying, okay, we've got these differences in cortical anatomy, we've got these differences in white matter, which is coming first, and how is that relating to differences in sulcal development and gyrification? So what we're at then in terms of adults, just in terms of anatomy, is we've gone from maybe five years ago, eight years ago, just coming up with raw volume differences, to now, recently, a multiplicity of techniques, each of which is imperfect, but which takes us to a place we wouldn't have dreamt about even a few years ago. It gives us the opportunity to see if we can use these measures to fractionate our samples, either from cases or from controls, but also within the autistic individuals. And it also allows us to work with our colleagues, say, in genetics, to say what particular subtypes may be driving this, what particular molecular pathways may be associated with these different aspects of differences. So that was all in adults. The other thing that we are, dem we are spending a lot of time developing is methodologies for infants. And this is work which is led by uh, Mark Johnson and colleagues at Birkbeck, who, by the way, they just had a wonderful article on Mark's work in Nature. Did anyone see that? I mean, just spectacular article. A, you should read it because it's just so inspiring, uh, but secondly, you should read it just because it's a great read, and it just shows you what you can achieve when you do things right. And so what Mark is doing together with us is to say, okay, what measures can we obtain, for example, using imaging or electrophysiology, that would be useful for fractionating the phenotype. So we've been developing things like functional imaging, myelin mapping, et cetera. But importantly is asking, how do differences that we detect using MRI, which cannot be used in all sites, how do they relate to those differences that we can obtain with alternative technologies such as NIRS? And do they provide us proxy measures that would then be useful in larger multi-site studies and or in intervention studies? This is just an example of some of the work that we've done together with Mark um, and together with Anna, actually, who, who led on this work. And this, for the, the postdocs here, is just an example of how you can get research funding to tell you kind of what you already know, okay? So this is uh, the functional imaging study of infants who are at risk for autism when they're asleep. So what we decided to do was to say, firstly, in a sleeping infant, does a healthy sleeping infant detect 
differences between human and non-human sounds. Okay, really simple. So what do you think the answer is? Yes, right? And then within a healthy sleeping infant, is there a differential brain activation to different emotional valence within the sounds that we'll be giving them? And the answer is yes. So those healthy human infants were hyper-responsive to negative emotions as compared to positive emotions. In contrast, what we found in infants who are at high risk for autism was that firstly, they did not show a significant difference between activation to human and non-human sounds. But secondly, they didn't activate in that same way to differences in emotional valence. So this is before the emergence of symptomatology, okay? So that's fine. So what have I demonstrated? I've shown you a load of pictures, right, showing we can detect differences between cases and controls, and we can fractionate the sample, and, you know, we're beginning to make progress. But that doesn't take us towards new treatments. All it takes us towards is beginning to understand the pathophysiology a little bit better in terms of structure and function. It doesn't take us yet towards molecular targets. And now I'm going to give you an example of how we've tried to do that. Again, involving a series of imperfect experiments. So just go with the flow and try and see the picture as it emerges. So what we decided to do with this is work led by Peter Scheifler and colleagues in Zurich was to examine this particular rodent model, which is the Neuroligin 3 knockout model, for uh, the pathophysiology because of its relationship to autism. So Neuroligin 3, key genetic um, associate of autistic spectrum disorder. Neuroligin 3 rodents have some autistic-like behaviors, and they also have some autistic-like um, cognitive deficits. So what did Peter find within these rodents? Um, what Peter's group reported was an increase in m one expression, a significant increase in ectopic synapse formation, reduced glutamatergic transmission, and that, all of the above, were rescued by re-expression of neuroligin-3. Well, that's great, but we can't genetically engineer humans. So what progress can we make in terms of pharmacologic manipulation? And we decided to take a two-pronged approach one was to use a very targeted molecular mechanism approach that would maybe lead to progress in the long term. And the second was to take a repurposing approach. So the first approach we used was to work together with Janssen, who had this m one antagonist. And what they showed was that we could get reversal of that ectopic synapse formation when we exposed those rodents to that antagonist. That's great, right? So what I've just shown you is something we got into science and you know we've got this little rodent and we reversed its synapses and all the rest of it, right? But what we need to do is to get that into humans. And to do that, we need a signal that we can get both in the rodent and in the human, right? Now, this is where imperfection comes in. And I'm gonna mention a very rude word in about a couple of slides. So one of the ways that you can do that is through imaging. The other way, of course, is through electrophysiology, and there's a variety of other ways, but just for the purposes of today, we're gonna to talk imaging. And just for the purposes of today, we're gonna to use this rude word, magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Why is it a rude word? Because there's many dark arts in neuroimaging, okay? But spectroscopy is one of the darkest of the dark arts. Uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, not least amongst which is you have to look at a whole chunk of tissue, as in we're talking, you know, centimeters by centimeters chunks of tissues. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that when we get a signal, we really don't know from where within that tissue where it's coming from. So if, say, I get a difference in glutamate, all I could tell you is there's this wedge of tissue that's got this difference in glutamate or GABA. Okay, I can't tell you which cellular component that's coming from. So, completely imperfect. But on the other hand, what else are you gonna do? Right? You've got very little else that you can do at the moment. So MR spectroscopy, this is work led by our colleagues in Roche. So she worked 
and Will Sporen worked together with Peter Scheifler in the basic laboratory in academia in Basel. They then go back to industry and they say, how do we translate that into a rodent model to a measure? And what Maria did was she looked at that neuroligand free knockout model, who remember from Peter's work was showing decreased glutamatergic transmission. She then shows within this group in the striatum a significant reduction in glutamate in that model as compared to wild type controls. And then the next question is, well, do we get it in humans, right? I mean, we've got this model. The question is, is it actually a model for the human disorder, right? So then we say, well, can, do we find a similar abnormality and a reduction in glutamate using this imperfect technique in humans? So postdocs, what do you think? Yes or no? Yeah, of course, because I wouldn't be showing you otherwise, right? So here we go. This is work by Jamie, who's one of our postdocs. Uh, as they say in London, he's sound as a pound. He's a really good guy and incredibly hardworking. And so what Jamie did was demonstrate that within this same brain region in these autistic individuals, you also have a significant reduction in that glutamatergic signal. He found no differences in GABA, by the way, using that. And he also found in this observational study an association between variation in glutamate and some of the um, social um, domains. Okay. So that's fine. I've shown you the stuff that's published. Okay. So we've got this G, this CNV, neuroligand 3, right? We've shown the cellular abnormality that we can reverse. We've taken it into the rodent. We've shown that it's different too. We've now shown that it's inhuman. We find the same thing. What do you think the next step is? Come on, postdocs. It's a rude word. Can we replicate? All right? So this is where my knees were knocking when we thought, oh my goodness me, you know, let's try and see if we can replicate. And so what Jamie did was he said, yes, we actually can replicate. Same finding in that same brain region. In, in a not massive, but a not insignificant uh, number of individuals in terms of an imaging study. He also found an association with social behavior. And then what Jamie did was he took it another step and he said, what may be the link between that difference in glutamate and behavior? And in this particular example, Jamie looked at the association between variation in glutamate and functional connectivity, resting functional connectivity, I should say, and demonstrated that A, there's a significant relationship between glutamate and functional connectivity between the seed region and rest of brain, but particularly impacting upon social brain regions, and that there's a difference between the cases and controls. So that's that experiment. Postdocs, why am I picking on you like this? So we've got this difference, we've got it in the rodent, we've replicated it in the human. Now what's the next question, do you think? I'm sorry? How can we treat it? Yeah, how can we treat it? Right, absolutely. That's exactly one question. But another question also is, we've only looked at one model. We've looked at the neuroligand 3 model, and we've seen, well, that's replicated in the human. If we take it the other way, and we think, well, we've got this abnormality, how can we also use animal models to try and explain the pathophysiology of what may be underpinning mechanisms in the human? And so what Jamie has done together with colleagues in Roche is to look at a variety of rodent models, not just neuroligand 3, and to ask, in which of those rodent models do we find a similar result to that in which we are in humans? So you can see here, we've got the BTBR, we've got Shank 3, we've got Catnap, we've got Neuroligand 3, etc. And so to cut a very long story short, we found that in all these rodent models, you had differences in glutamate and or GABA in different brain regions, but the only ones which recapitulated the human difference was that of the valproate model and the neuroligand model, which makes us begin to think within this particular abnormality, albeit crudely measured with spectroscopy, in this particular brain region, we may now be a step further to understanding what the potential genetic and or environmental contributions might be to that difference. And therefore, that gives us a target, a potential target mechanism. 
The next thing that you quite rightly said is, is can we treat and what happens then? So this work that I'm going to show you now is the work of three amazingly talented uh, women. There's Maria here, who you've seen before from Roche. There's Laura, who is one of our PhD students at the Institute, and also Alice, who's one of our PhD students. Alice, I'm extremely proud of, because not only is she an amazingly intellectual um, PhD student, she's also a Thai kickboxer, an, an extraordinarily successful one. So aggressive and so successful that she broke her foot when she was um, boxing, so just tremendous woman. And so what all these three amazing women are doing are saying, how can we use rodent models to begin to understand pathophysiology? And can we model what we're doing? So Laura, for example, is using tool compounds within autistic individuals, and then she's using those same tool compounds in rodent models. The same with Maria and the same with Alice. And the tool compound I'm going to show you now is of Riluzol, which I'll explain in a second. But suffice to say, we are using a variety of tool compounds. And we're using those tool compounds based upon a combination of reasonings. Number one is those which are explicitly targeting molecular mechanisms that we think are candidates and that we're going to be working together with our colleagues in the pharmaceutical industry in terms of getting targets for new treatments. So, for example, you know, you want a specific mu opioid receptor agonist or antagonist, we would be working together with that, with them for that. That's terrific, but that leads to long-term progress. What we want to do is to see if we can make shorter-term progress, and that means you've got to get down and dirty and use repurposing. So we take compounds which are out there, uh, available for other disorders at the minute, to see do they also modulate these uh, neurochemical pathways in a way that we want to, and is that informative in any way? So the data I'm going to show you today is from this uh, compound called Riluzol. The reason we chose that was that um, it's already on the market, as I said, as a treatment for motor neurone disease. We know it modulates glutamate release. There's some initial evidence um, that it has a role via mglu one which, remember, is one of the Peter's uh, findings, and also enhances GABA-A, because we had uh, evidence, which I might come on to if I have time later on, that GABA-A might also be different. And so this is what the very preliminary results, which we do need to replicate. The cases are on the right-hand side, and the controls are on the left-hand side. The circles are baseline, and these squares are post-challenge with Riluzol. And the purpose of this slide really is just to demonstrate to you that even using this mucky technique, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, we can shift that signal in EI balance using Riluzol. And what we can also do is demonstrate proof of concept that these between-group differences in resting functional connectivity at baseline are also modulated by that Riluzol. Not reversed, but mod modulated. So the next question then, of course, is which particular receptor subtype is, is driving that? A and then B, of course, can be replicated. The other question also is because, obviously, not everyone would respond to the treatment in the same way, to the same degree, is if we're going to run a treatment trial, can we use this as a stratification technique? So is there any relationship between your GABA level or glutamate level at baseline and your responsivity to that medication in either the EI balance or in terms of your functional connectivity? This hugely preliminary data suggests that there may be a relationship between resting GABA and resting glutamate and your responsivity to that um, compound, but that really absolutely needs replication. So I've told you now then that we've got these differences in glutamate signaling that we're finding in the rodent, that we're finding in the human, and that we're working in two ways, a more pure scientific way to work with tool compounds directly targeting differences and a less precise way using repurposing of current medications around glutamate. What about GABA and GABA receptors? This for our postdocs is a great example of never believe your own publicity or your own results when they first come out, okay, especially in preliminary data. 
So we were actually quite excited by GABA A as a potential target because of the genetic architecture of autism. And we also had these very, very, very early findings suggesting that there may be significant differences between cases and controls in GABA A receptor occupancy. So then we went to replication based upon this. If obviously there'd be no difference, we wouldn't have gone ahead. And this is the result of the full study. Absolutely no difference whatsoever. So in terms of receptor occupancy, we find no difference at all with GABA A. So we found no difference in the overall GABA concentration and no difference in GABA A receptor. Does that mean that there's actually no difference in GABAergic function? Because that is a different question, right? And so what Jamie has also done is use this paradoxical motion perception task, which is sensitive um, to GABA levels. And what he's shown is that there is a significant difference between cases and controls at baseline. So in other words, they have differences in GABAergic function even though we are not able in vivo to detect differences in receptor occupancy or in total GABA pool. And then what Jamie said was, well, can I actually modulate that difference in paradoxical motion perception? And in this very preliminary work, there's a suggestion that he may be able to do that. I'm sorry that the error bars didn't come out, but actually the error bars are looking pretty good, and this is highly significant, but it's in a small sample. So you know, what, have we, what have we got there then? So what we've got there is that we've got these brain imaging techniques which give us outcome measures, but the other key message from this is maybe there's actually something which is way more simple that if we're gonna be running a trial and we, all we want to be seeing is if you have an impact on your medication, maybe actually there's these very simple other techniques that we can be using which are relating to brain differences. So that's all in adults, right, uh, and in young kids, which is kind of a little bit late in the day. The question then is, are we able in these infants to measure that same signal? And this is the work of Inez Potes, and what Inez is saying is, are we able to map across gestation and then postnatally and in early infancy variation in glutamate? Because you won't be aware that there's this big switch in, GLA in GABA and glutamate uh, across early development. So what Inez is demonstrating, actually for the first time ever, is that we are able to measure glutamate intrauterine in infant brain, and that prior to birth there is a significant uh, increase as opposed to post-birth and early infancy. And the other thing that we're doing, which is kind of fun, and this comes with a huge, huge, massive dose of, look, we're just looking, right? We're not actually thinking that this means anything yet, but just to show you the kind of things that we're getting. Is Inez is also relating differences in glutamate signal here and across development to things like paternal uh, age, maternal uh, degree of autistic, uh, self-report of autistic traits, etc. But also we're able to relate the exposure of these infants intrauterine through their mothers to selective serotonin re reuptake inhibitors, so antidepressants versus no antidepressants. So even if you're just interested in the impact of, say, medications on this particular neurochemical system in healthy infants, it looks like it may have potential with all the caveats of the problems of MRS. Well, that's all fine and good, right? So I've shown you these ways that we can potentially fractionate our samples and identify new molecular mechanisms. One of the keys also is, well, how can we work with you to help you design your experiments so that if you go forward to the FDA or to the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, that they will accept your pilot evidence as either a way of stratifying your samples or as an outcome measure. And so brokered by Roche, we uh, went through the procedure which normally a pharmaceutical company would have to go through, which we presented our portfolio and our protocol in an open way to this kind of court-like procedure. And you get this criticism and sort of response, et cetera. And essentially, the EMA were signing up 
to nearly all of the approaches that we're suggesting may be ways ahead, with, with a few caveats, in terms of using it, these approaches as stratification tools, not as outcome measures, but as stratification tools, and particularly, potentially as predictive uh, outcome measures, sorry, predict predictive measures. The other thing that we've now done is also said that in future, this early work, we need to be running in the, in, in the context of clinical trials. And so we've now been training up and getting ready of 78 sites across 37 countries in Europe to GCP standard that would then be ready to kind of rock and roll with whatever intervention it is that you wanted to be running. And that could be a behavioral intervention or it could be a pharmacologic intervention and it could be, for example, that you'd come to us and say, well, we want to run an intervention in low-functioning children. Um, and then we'd look in our database and say, okay, fine. We've got five or six centers which are into that. They come to GCP standard. They have X cases. Then these would be the people to go to and, and, and be brokered for. We've not yet run a clinical trial, as I said, and that's not our purpose. Our purpose is, is to get things ready to go if that comes to it. So... In summary, then, what have, I, what have I told you? I've hopefully told you that we've got an awful long way to go, but I think that we are beginning to make progress, both in terms of understanding the pathophysiology, but also, importantly, getting readouts from rodent models that we can translate into humans and potentially back, and that we, we think, at least, that this is going to help us begin to identify new molecular targets, but also to be able to fractionate the phenotype so that when you come to run a trial, you would be able to say, I want to be running a trial in 40 people with autism who have this particular phenotype, however defined, as opposed to running it in 100 individuals with a whole variety of different phenotypes. So I think we've made quite a bit of progress in terms of potentially making progress, I should say, rather, in, in terms of understanding what's inside the tin. A long way to go, but I think we're beginning to make progress. I think also we're making a lot of progress in Europe in terms of this, that we really are getting tremendous working relationships between the basic scientists and the clinician scientists. I know that you already have that great thing going on here at Mind, but it's really been a revelation to me and wonderfully rewarding for my colleagues. And I think that within Europe now, we're at this, right? We don't have that big dog, little dog thing. We've got two little cute dogs who are all getting on well together. But, and where does that leave us, though? What, what's the, the pathway ahead? The pathway ahead is twofold. Number one, for us to recognize that autism is a lifelong disorder. And so we need to have treatment approaches which are of use to people throughout the life course doesn't mean to say it has to be the same treatment approach. It could be different, different approaches. But we need to take a life course approach. The other thing that we need to do is we've been able to sort out the soup to some extent within the tins in terms of fractionating the phenotype. But the other key thing is what about things that look different on the outside that are actually the same on the inside? So what are the shared versus distinct mechanisms that lead one person with one genetic hit, let's just call it, Neuroligin 3, for example, at the moment, what is it that drives that person, or Shank 3, drives that person down to have an autistic spectrum disorder, that person to have an intellectual disability, or that person to have a psychotic illness? So what is it about these things which are the same on the inside but different on the outside? So what, how can we understand those shared versus distinct mechanisms? And once we begin to understand that, I think we're beginning to make real progress. So if you want more details, please do feel free to uh, look up on the web from Will, which is Will here, Spore and I. And if you've got any uh, questions at all, please do feel free to email me or Will. Horrible comments to Will. Uh, nice, nice comments to me, if you don't mind. And with that, I'll finish, and thank you for your attention. And so one of the questions I had in your talk was, uh, you had these really nice spectroscopy data from the Neuroligin 3 mouse. So have you been able to get 
any people with a neuroligin-3 mutation or Shank-3 mutation. So Tama Borgeron identified them. I think they were in Sweden, and then there's some others after that. Yeah. Is it possible to do exactly the kind of stratification that we do with mice in Europe because you actually do know the patients who are first identified with specific mutations? Yeah. Um, the answer to that is that's my next grant. But <laughs> no, seriously, actually, we've, we've actually were lucky enough to get add-on funding um, from the EU to do exactly what it is that you're suggesting. Um, we're starting with Shank 3. Um, those individuals are coming in to our labs as we speak. In terms of neuroligin 3, that's a bigger ask because they're harder to identify currently. Um, but in terms of Shank 3, yes, definitely. Yeah. I don't know what we'll find, obviously, because we've just started, but absolutely. And the other thing that we're doing is we're working together with our colleagues in Iceland because all those individuals are actually also having electrophysiology, behavioral phenotyping, and imaging. So, and we also will have those individuals with and without the clinical phenotype of autism, but the same genetic lesion. So we'll be able to ask then about what's happening. My question is, if in your clinical trials you include individuals who have only what's called idiopathic autism, or they include patients with also syndromic form of autism? Right. Uh, that, that's a fantastic question. Um, the answer to that is that currently, the current, treat, the, the current approach within trials is that you would normally go with a non-syndromic form of ASD into your trial, um, w which is a reasonable approach, but potentially a more interesting question because you think you know the genetic mechanism within the syndromic variety, right, would be to have your trial in them. And there have been trials in that area, for example, with our baclofen, um, and I'm afraid they were a bust. Um, and we don't understand why they were a bust. It, it's likely um, for a variety of complex scientific reasons, but also in, in terms of the outcome measures were just dreadful. Just didn't have enough ability to pick up a change in signal. So, so I'm going to pose a, a, a difficult in, uh, question, and, and, and that is, I mean, it's a marvelous talk and, and again, inspirational, but Eighty percent no, no, no. <laughs> of the neurons in the brain are yeah. glutamatergic, right. working through different receptors, right. having different circuitry relationships. Right. So how far away are we from getting a difference in glutamatergic signal to really understanding enough to be able to do what Simeon was talking about, actually coming up with a medication that may you know, try and treat the, the symptoms. I mean, it seems to me that we're still sort of up at 30,000 feet. And, oh, right. And we, yeah. There's absolutely no doubt that, that, that we are, right? And in terms of um, identifying specific molecular mechanisms and specific target, new compounds which target that specific mechanism, we're light years away. But what we, if you just think of at the moment, just something really simple, right? Like, Glutamate or EI balance might be a final common pathway, you know that horrible phrase, right? And what you want to do is just show that this particular treatment approach impacts upon that potential final common pathway. And frankly, you don't care whether you hit them around the head with a bit of rhubarb or actually whether it's aspirin or rilizol, right? That you could be relatively agnostic. Right, right. I, I guess that how you influence the EI balance, though, could happen in a myriad of ways. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Completely. Yeah. 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 We, and the council perfection is, and the way forward in the long term is to do exactly that. But in the short term, one of the questions is, can we use the things which are available to us in a better way? Sure, sure. sure. Yeah. Understood. But this is a, a real question. I'm not just trying to trick you up here. I, I've always done stuff in autism in children, and the idea of having adults, which you know far more about than, than I do, opens up questions you, for, for me, like, can one do interventions with adults in the sense of is the, is, whilst I might be able to change brain chemistry, to change connectivity would take much longer. And so, so does that mean that actually one would have to do trials that lasted several years if you were looking for a behavioral 
change? Or do we have to do all our trials on children? Um, there's a number of questions within that. Um, sure. So the question really is that if, we treat, if we're looking at trials in adults, are you really going to expect to see a change, number one? Number two is, if we are going to see a change, don't we really need to be looking at long-term treatment interventions as opposed to relatively short-term trials? And number three, shouldn't we really be asking the question in those groups whose brains may be more plastic, inverted commas, so in other words, in younger populations? The answer to that is yes. Um, if, if it was absolutely crucial that you carry out trials within children because A, they are more likely to be more plastic, right? But B, you can also then be combining it with other educational interventions. And also, you're, if you are getting an impact, if you're thinking about you know, the slope of the curve, as it were, just a minimal impact could have a significant downstream effect on educational attainment, sociability, et cetera, which in turn gives, gives much greater outcome. So yes, the difficulty, of course, is actually carrying out pharmacologic trials in children. Um, I would feel very uncomfortable going to a group of parents and saying, I've got this new compound, I've got absolutely zero, zero evidence that it works in anything but a rat. Um, now can I experiment on your child? Uh, I think the answer would be no, right? Um, so, but then just in terms of the adult, yes, you're absolutely right that because we get a change in connectivity, inverted commas, there's, that's a long way from changing the behavior. But the first thing to do is to demonstrate you actually can change the functional connectivity. It can be functional connectivity as opposed to, say, anatomical connectivity, right? If you improve that functional connectivity, does that then just help you engage and improve your outcome? The answer is we don't know. In answer to your question about how long a treatment trial has got to be for, again, if I, if I was industry, I wouldn't even begin to think about eight to 12 week interventions. Whether I'm looking at in children or whether I'm looking at adults, I'd be thinking I need to be given this intervention for about a year minimum. And I've got to be investing major money in, in a trial in which I'm taking a more naturalistic approach. That answer your question? When you, you just, in your response, separated uh, working with children who would have both the pharmacological intervention and the educational intervention versus adults. However, adults also learn and their brains also respond to learning. And I don't see why you couldn't use that same pairing of behavioral interventions oh. with drug responses in adults as well to look at that, you that absolutely, combination. No, I'm sorry. I wasn't meaning that in a theoretical way. I was meaning in a pragmatic way. So for example, we are doing exactly what you're saying in my own group, right? But you cannot generalize that to the general population, at least within the United Kingdom, because those sorts of services aren't available to adults. So whatever we came up with would not generalize. So I, I would not now be able to get a healthcare system to fund an ongoing educational intervention, for example, within a young adult population. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, Fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.